to start with. All right, so on our test, on your test, on your final, I've got it, I've got it, and I'm gonna still working on it, but it is gonna have 50, the first 50 questions are going to be over all of AMP2. Going back to the very first stuff, so just flip through the first couple of chapters, and they're big, broad questions, including like five of five of the uh, uh, ten of those fifty are going to be from the, this final four chapters. So it's going to be about you know, like I said, we break it down into ten into, into five little groups, and I'll have to hand grade those. We have to collect these data that everybody taking AMP will get those. And then I had 20, 20 more questions off of urinary, twenty more off of uh, this chapter. We're going to go over to, uh, over uh, excuse me. 20 more off of reproduction and this chapter with a few of this chapter in it, maybe maybe five or six off this chapter. And then five out of that uh, electrolyte chapter. Okay. So, and then I've got some short answer questions. Uh, so there's a couple in there of that, but then I wrote some big questions about the, uh, from our lectures, especially the one we did the other night. I think I told y'all, you might want to go back and watch that one. I know y'all probably saw it right, but we went over the female cycle, right? That was a big one. Then I went on about a 20 minute talk about another one of my favorite questions. So I thought I better put it on there or y'all get mad. And so right now I'm trying, I've got it set up where it's 105. It's actually 110 points. And I can't figure out why it's doing that. Uh, so I, I meant it to be a 105 point test. Okay. So I mean, I was actually was at home this afternoon trying to figure out why it's counting some, something double in there. So I'm going to go back in there and recalculate why it's doing that. Okay. So what I would do, and I think Dodger even, and I think me and you talked about this. I think he got caught on time last time. I would go through it as fast as I could and just guess if you don't know. Most likely you can narrow it down to two. Just go ahead and guess. Go all the way through it because that the uh, the, uh, the one on the reproductive cycle is five point question. You know, female cycle. And then there's another one on there on um, genetics that we talk about meiosis is five point question. So you don't want to miss those two ten point questions. But I tried to I tried to make it 105 point test and I can't quite figure out why it's making it count 110. So if I so if the, if the grades if somebody makes 110 I'm going to go in there and take five off everybody's test. I'm not going to have 110 points on the final. Okay, I'm just saying that you know because I know we got we had a little bit of cheating on that test three, and you wouldn't believe the credit we're seeing in the other classes talking to other teachers to where I wouldn't personally give too much credit to anybody's. And I that's bad because some people don't write real hard. I, I shouldn't say it like that, but just FYI. I've done talked about every teacher in my group off the off the ledge, including one teacher. We did a whole test, get one, and made them all take it over, made it all essay. Uh, shit, so just FYI, uh, please just do your own work. I'm not going to try to zoom with y'all. I'm just going to give y'all like 50 minutes. Uh, and I think we had uh, 45 on that last one, so I went back five more. But I think it's 97, 95 short answer questions. Uh, most of them are multiple, multiple choice. None of them are in any test bank, so you can't Google them. But those other two questions are five points, right? And I think it may take a little bit of trouble on the, especially the, the female cycle is gonna take a little bit of work, okay? And I'm gonna record it and put it up for everybody else so they can know that. So I didn't put as much short answers as I wanted to, but, but a lot, the ones I told you, like some of those short answers I wanted, they're in the multiple choice. I mean like, oh, Robin talked about that. So I, I did go through them all and look at them and I, it's gonna randomly pull some. So your test may be different from somebody else's. But everybody gets those short answer questions that I talked about, the, uh, especially the female cycle. Okay, is everybody cool? Let's just run through this. Okay, and we'll, uh, I'm gonna skip So I'm not a real big fan on human de development. Most of y'all have to take a whole semester of uh, human growth and development, right? And, uh, but I do like genetics and she doesn't do a super good job, I don't think on genetics. So uh, once again, still not my, you know, not as fun as the reproductive chapter, but this is pretty, but there's some cool stuff in here though. Okay, so I'm going to pull up PowerPoint. By the way, I've got PowerPoint, so I came up school so I could do it because I got dizzy one night trying to do the scroll through. So you should be able to see it pretty well. Thank y'all for being on video, so I can see if G Gabby and Hallie wave at me and, and say, "Are you happy?" No, look, y'all can stop me, and I'll, I'll answer your question. That's why I like the Zoom. Okay, but if I can't see y'all, then I assume most likely in error that y'all got it all figured out, right? So I think it's a really good idea for us to, to get where I can see you. And as my daughter said, you don't even know anybody's there, man. Everybody, they just leave it on and go watch TV, go turn on Netflix or something, right? I'm joking. All right, can y'all see it okay? Everybody got it? Okay, so anyway, this first one is on development, the first half of the chapter. And we're just kind of, I'm going to kind of 
go through it pretty quick, I think, if it works. Okay, and it's just talking about how that how the embryo is going to develop. Then it's going to actually start out talking about conception and so forth. But a couple of it fields of biology, developmental biology studies how the body, the egg forms into the human. Uh, embryology is a study of the first 38 weeks inside the female womb. Uh, you may want to major in embry embryology. Uh, the prenatal period, developmental stages that occur the first 38 weeks within the womb. Also, period usually referred to as pregnancy. Blah blah blah. And then postnatal is birth until you get thrown out of your family's house, right? And you have to go on your own, right? I'm just joking. Uh, once again, I'm not going to put a lot of these specific dates on here, but like pre-embryonic lasts for the first two weeks. Embryonic is extends from week three through a week of eight. Not really big on that per se, but let's get into it, get in on into it. Fetal period lasts nine weeks to 38 weeks. Okay, and it's, the baby is referred to as the fetus at that point. Okay, well, this, I like. I'm going to skip a little bit until I get to the pictures. But you can see here that that at conception, you know, remember you're called a zygote when the sperm and egg. We'll see in just a minute with a lot more detail. And I want you to know it goes really deep into the fertilization and how the sperm gets in there. We'll look at it in a minute, but it gets kind of a little bit deeper. Than I want to go, but uh, this is the uh, once you once you're a zygote, then you divide into two, four, eight, and then around 16 cell, you're called a morel. Then at 32 to 64 to 128, you're, a, you're called a blastula or blastocyst. Now, remember, if y'all remember in AMP1, it's like the third lab we looked at, why well, fish blastula, right? And onion root tip. And those guys were probably uh, 64, 128 cells, balls, and each one of those balls was in one of our stages of mitosis. You remember us looking at slices of that. Uh, so this pre-embryonic period then runs for about two weeks. And then this embryonic period, from three weeks to eight weeks, so the blast itself keeps dividing and you start to take on the form of a human. Uh, then, it's, then this point is called uh, an embryo and then the fetus from nine weeks to 38 weeks of development. And nine to 38 weeks is about full term, I believe, or close to it. Okay, and once again, infancy it carries on for two years, two years right after birth and then childhood lasts from two years until puberty starts. Then we have the wonderful fun adolescence, right? Which is cray cray, right? When you get the hormones kick in and that can be wild. Uh, then you have adulthood, right? And then at the end, we can have what's called senescence as we get older. Okay. All right, I'm gonna move on through much, just some blood terms here. I'll recap the test thing again at the end if you want to. Okay, so back, re repeating kind of what we talked about here, you can see, remember that the sperm cells are going to be made right in the uh, in the ovary, right? Excuse me, in the testicle, right? And it's going to get down, again, it's going to swim into the vagina, go up and at the uterus, and then turn left to right, going up one of the fallopian tubes, right? And then we're going to see the zygote then forms these different embryos. Then we come starts this becomes this blastocyst. We start to see some of these embryonic membranes that we're going to find here in a few minutes. Then, of course, the gametes are formed by meiosis. It does a little bit of re re repeating some stuff that we talked about. Now, remember that, that the sperm and egg are 23 chromosomes. And in fertilization, when you perform become, become a zygote, you form that diploid number. And we're going to come back just a little bit and talk about genetics and how that plays a role. And then, so these chromosome numbers are going to come back to, to, uh, to be important again in just a minute. So we'll come back and talk about that. Okay, I want to get on the picture of this. This is pretty, pretty gets on my nerves. Just, I'm not, y'all don't need me to read to y'all. I'm going to kind of walk you through it. Darn it. I hate to, she got way too many texts here. Never mind, I'm going back, changing my mind because I, I have a guy actually got in here early and went through these PowerPoints once, but she really just got a lot of information here that's just almost overwhelming to me at one point here. Okay, so the, I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights of it, but I hate, I'm not going to read them all to y'all. Uh, this is kind of interesting one down here. When ovulation occurs, the, the oocyte is only viable for 24 hours. So when the egg is going down the fallopian tube, it's only got about a 24 hour period that it can, fertilization can occur. At the end of the, of the fallopian tube, also called the uterine tube, there's this little area called the ampulla. And this is usually where fertilization occurs with the sperm coming in here and fertilizing that egg as it's coming down, going toward the, toward the uterus. It's also interesting here that 
that sperm inside the female is viable for about three days, usually two days before and maybe a day after fertilization or after, yeah, after uh, two, a day after having sex, uh, copulation, so excuse me. So two days before and a day after sex, the sperm are still good. Although I've seen some data showing that most of the fertilization occurs uh, if the sperm is already in the house or, or right before the female uh, ovulates. So if you take that into full scope here, if you had sex, I don't know what, three days before, there could be a five day window there that the female can have sex and, and get fertilized. But I would say it's probably closer to three, but more likely the day of and the day before is what we're seeing most data suggests. Uh, before the sperm can fertilize the egg, it has to do this capitulation where it is going to stop worrying about, being, it's gonna be fully mobile and it's gonna have be ready to have this acrosome, which is a chromosome pack of, excuse me, a pack of enzymes, digestive enzymes at the tip of the sperm's head that's gonna, it's gonna penetrate the ovum and break down some of the layers. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. These, these have to be broken open. Uh, also present in the semen are postoglandins, which, which cause the female uterus to contract. And that is thought to help pull the sperm up in to the female vagina. It's also thought, although not completely required, but if a woman, woman has an orgasm, uh, after the male ejaculates, then this may help pull the sperm up into the uterus also. Although it's not required for the woman to have an orgasm to get pregnant, as, as y'all are probably aware of that, okay? Uh, so anyway, you know, because of rape and stuff, obviously a woman doesn't want to be pregnant, get pregnant from, from that, but it can happen. So that is irrelevant of whether or not that the girl enjoys it or not, which is kind of a just terrible thing and everything that it happens. Okay, uh, moving on from that. Uh, here are these layers. There's, the there's that acrosome I was talking about, uh, the sperm that has this enzyme here that's going to break down the protein layers of the uh, granulosa cells around the egg. Uh, and take a look, this is actually kind of what it looks like. And she gets a little bit more detail than I went here. But here's showing what's going on here. You can see the sperm coming in, and, and then the sperm releases in, and then it's 23, 23 chromosomes are going to fuse with the female chromosome to form the zygote talks about the acrosome releasing its enzymes to penetrate through here. It actually takes more than one sperm to release enough enzymes to, to, to get through this layer, but only one wins. And once that one end enters, then chemicals are released that destroy the receptors for the other sperm and they, and they no longer can come in. So you don't want two sperm to come in. If you do, you get a condition, I'm going back here, you get a condition called triploidy, where you have three sets of chromosomes and that's fatal pretty much to the human embryo. I mean, I think there may have been some people lived, you know, maybe a, a year or six months or something more like that. That's pretty much game over. And so those sperm are, are wiped out. Once one gets in, the others are killed in this, uh, by this outside layer of the eggs, which is pretty wild. Okay. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, infertility is the inability to produce a pregnancy after one year of unprotected sexual intercourse with a couple. So that does happen. We'll talk about that in a minute too, but I just think she's got some slides in there. Uh, it is kind of cool that she usually doesn't form do the lactic division, the female egg, until sperm are knocking on the door. And there's that other polar body being made there, which is kind of kind of wild when you think about that. Uh, then your zygote, and then the first couple of divisions, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, are called cleavage, and the cells multiply, and then you form that blast blastula. Right, which is around 32 to, to 64 to 128 cells. Okay, all these are identical, right? So far, uh, I said they went down to the left where I saw a report where they took a blastula, or when it, the first two cells that divide into two, they made four, eight, and made four, eight clones, would have been eight identical twins, and they killed them all. So, we in the laboratory, they played around with this where they could, we could literally clone your baby and have backups in the in the in the ultra freeze in case something happened to you which is kind of wild if you think of it of course it wouldn't be the same person but it would be a redo i guess you can say pretty wild what we can do uh so the trait let me get on there's a group of cells on the outside of the developing embryo called the tropobi cells and they're going to attach to the uterus and they also become part of the placenta and here's a cool picture showing that so day one, we got fertilization here, your, your zygote. And then look, as you go down the fallopian tube, look at this. Here we go, here's, our, here's the ampulla torso. So, so fertilization usually occurs in the first part, I think I said the last part, but it's actually the first part of it. 
And as you're developing, look at that, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, Moriel is a 16, and then Blastula is 32, 64, 128. It's going to come in here. So it's usually around day four or five, well, four to seven, when you implant in a mother's endometrium lining in her uterus. So you, you know, so you had sex there too before this, the fertilization, and then the baby comes down and implants. It's pretty cool. Okay, now if early on, like in the uh, in the cleavage stages right in here, or day two, day three, all the way to morel, if these cells pull apart and form two complete separate individuals, and it can be not just the first two cells, but even the first eight or sixteen. Then you get identical twins like, like we had in our in this class. They're not on tonight, but you know, identical twins are called monozygotic, monozygotic identical twins because they come from one zygote, that first cell. Okay. And uh, very rarely would you have triplets or quadruplets that are identical. That's that's very unusual, right? And then more common is this dizygotic fraternal twins that come from two different eggs and two different sperms. So, you, so, so some women multi-ovulate each month, so she would have two or three eggs, and if she's, had, she's trying to make a baby, so that's how you get triplets. That's the most common way to get twins and triplets, which is pretty cool. Now here's a cool stat, this down the blue, but look at this. One in eight married couples in the United States never have the number two and they want out. So they have trouble getting pregnant, sustained pregnancy. Most common problem is hormonal problems, the female cycle, ovarian diseases, obstruction of the uterine tube, and then conditions in the uterus that make it unable to maintain the baby or the embryo. So usually uh, male in males, most common cause is low sperm count and females, those who just went over. But usually it's the female thing they look at first, those are the most common. Assisted reproductive techniques include uh, artificial insemination, gamete, interfallopian transfer where the embryo, the gamete is made and you drop it down at like flashula stage down the fallopian tube. And then they even got zygote interflow. Actually, so we mentioned that one in vitro. They can grow it even bigger and put it down in the floating tube for it to go down and plant in the uterus. Uh, look at that. Uh, success rate is around 47% for a woman under 35, 38 for a woman between 35 and 37. So that's pretty good odds, right, of that working for these ladies. But in this process, there are a bunch of embryos made that they usually put more down in there than they need and have to go in and abort some of them. And that's why that girl out in California had like six, seven, eight kids that time, or whatever it was, nine, I think it was, some crazy number. Okay, implantation, then the embryo is going to implant in the, in the endometrial lining, and those trouble bath cells will start producing ACG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This is the hormone that we're looking for when we're doing a pregnancy test. So basically, this hormone is never produced until you get pregnant. Remember, and the progesterone levels go up. I'm thinking like the 28-day cycle, look. They go up, and then estrogen falls off, you have a period. Up, fall off, and you have a period. When you get pregnant, progesterone and estrogen go through the roof, and then this one spikes extremely high. And so this is the hormone that tells the brain baby's on board and prevents you from having another baby for nine months. So you don't have another period until after uh, you know, you've, you've, had, you've given birth. Wouldn't that be awful to give, have your birth and come in two months later with little Jimmy Jr., and you know, like have a baby every month for like, Three or four months, that would be a nightmare. So that's part of the mechanism. ACG is what we look for in the pregnancy test. Look for it in the urine, and that's what we're looking for. Okay, uh, other ones here, we're gonna talk, then as the baby starts to develop, we'll see the germ layers, real famous ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm. We'll get to them again in a minute. Miscarriage or spontaneous abortion is when something goes wrong with the baby's development and you lose the baby. Usually due to chromosome numbers being wrong, which would lead to some severe developmental issues and the baby not growing properly. I think it says that one in, I think somewhere I read, one in four pregnancies end in a miscarriage. So if y'all try to have four or five kids, you're gonna experience a miscarriage somewhere in your, pregnant, in your, in your married life or your reproductive life. Uh, an atopic pregnancy is a, is a pregnancy that occurs when the embryo is outside the uterus. Usually this is in the fallopian tube and it has to be terminated. A ruptured fallopian tube could lead to, could kill the mother. So the doctors routinely just remove the baby uh, in the fallopian tube. There have been a couple of cases documented where the, uh, the egg fell out and didn't fall into the frambrea, like the little catcher's mitt when it left the ovary and it went in the abdomen. The woman had had sex with her partner and the sperm came up in the abdominal cavity, fertilized the egg, 
and then it implanted on like the stomach or small intestine and formed a placenta. And so they've been at least two or three, I've seen cases that went full term where the baby had to be born by uh, abdominal surgery and that artery, that the, the, the artery going to the placenta, because uh, think about this, when the birth, you tear off, the baby tears off the placenta, right, and comes all out, then you give birth to the placenta. And if that placenta, when it releases, if it does not clot, you're going to bleed to death in about, you know, two or three minutes. So this is a really good idea of why I think you should give birth at the hospital. I know all this have birth at home and, and the swimming pool and all that's real cool. Sounds like a great idea, but if that if something goes wrong with that uterus and it doesn't hold that clot, then you're going to bleed to death in just a few minutes. I mean, you have to go in there and do a hysterectomy, remove that, and tie these arteries off. And so the, I saw one on like Discovery Channel where this woman had a baby etopically, and luckily she came in and they recognized it when a nursing uh, rotation was shifted. And so all the nurses on the first rotation stayed there and they said, helped. And then another set of nurses helped. And I think they used like 30 units of blood on this woman. She almost bled to death. Uh, keep trying to get that to stop. So pretty, pretty wild stuff that can happen there. Kind of interesting story. Uh, here it is. Here's the embryo implanting. Day 47. Tropoblast cells right in here are going to mention them in here. These blastocells, and they're going to start making HCG. And then as the baby develops eight and 12, you start to form the three germ layers we're talking about. Remember, ectoderm is skin and brain, nervous system. Mesoderm is muscle and bone. And endoderm is the digestive system and most of the glands that have to do with digestion. Okay, we'll also mention these real famous embryonic germ layers, and these are always on the ACTs, MCATs, the yolk sac, amnion, allantosis, and the chorion. We'll look at those in just a minute. Well, I guess we'll do them right now. Actually, let's go to the table. There's a good little table here. Uh, we summarize these. And here they are on the embryo look. You can see there's the yolk sac yellow here. The allantosis is over here. The embryo itself is right there. It is floating in the chorion and the amniotic fluid held by the chorion, this outer layer of the chorion. That's going to form the placenta and going to conform the, you know, to the you know, biblical cord and placenta to the mother. And that allantosis right there actually forms the umbilical cord too. Here we go. So the yolk sac can, can contribute to the digestive tract and the source of first blood cells and also forms the ovaries and, and the testicles in us. Now, in a chicken, the yolk sac, to think about it, when you think about chicken eggs, they're all self-contained. They don't have a placenta hooked to mother. So the yolk sac is nutrient nutri nutri material for the baby to eat. It's his food. Uh, the amnion and, and the amniotic fluid serves to surround the baby in this fluid and shock absorbers, like floating in a lake. I mean, you've seen the movies where people jump in the swimming pool and bullets and stuff, and the world can burn, explosions can occur outside, and they're protected in the swimming pool, right? Even I've seen those California fires where people jumped in the pool, stayed underwater a minute, barely come up to get air, and the fire, fire blew over. So this is super protective in that floating in that fluid. Uh, in many cases where women have been killed in a car wreck, we put on a machine to keep them breathing for the baby to make it, you know, six months when they take the baby early, and the baby still be fine quite often. It's pretty wild. But, if, okay, other ones here, the anatosis forms the bladder, uh, the biblical cord in us. They, but in the chicken, this is its uh, waste disposal. This is the quarter pot for them. So this is where they put their nitrogen waste as they're developing because they don't have any opening to the outside. But it forms our biblical cord, which is our way of getting one of our waste products too. And the chorion is the outer layer, forms the placenta, and protects the baby, the outermost layer of this, of these protective layers. And we can go back and see them there. And the amnion that fluid, the baby's floating in, the chorion out here, and this you can see the biblical cord forming with the placenta over here with the yolk sac there, and allantosis little sac right in there. Pretty cool. I know a couple of those are on our test. Those are all on those MCATs and all. They love them on those interest tests. We already mentioned the uh, tubal pregnancy. I'm going the right way. All right, we'll go forward. All right, then we're going to have gastrulization. That is when the embryo starts to form the digestive tract. And so we get a pinching in and a tube forming through, remember? And if you remember, every, if you get into more biology, you'll know that uh, all the animals develop one of two ways, either mouth first or the anus first. And we're in the anus first group. We're in the deuterostome, so we develop butt first, which is kind of weird. And then the tube at the other end would be our mouth, okay? Uh, then we get, you see the primitive streak here starting to form, and then we'll get the head tail formation. And then gastrulization forms that gut going through. And you can see it here, the pinching in of that tube. Then we'll get a neuralization where the spinal cord starts to form. 
I like the pictures here because a lot of times we see them like this in boats. And people go, that don't look like a human. But really, you're looking at a cross section of this little developing embryo. Okay. And you can see that neuralization and neural tube forming in there. And these three derm layers red is mesoderm, uh, blue is ectoderm, and, and yellow is, is uh, the uh, blue is endoderm, red, the yellow is endoderm, red is uh, mesoderm, and the blue is ectoderm. Sorry. Uh, so we get the organ formations. Uh, and then we got a table of the uh, three germ layers. We'll get to in just a second. Here is a human embryo at four weeks. That's about how big you are when you're when you're you get a pregnancy test, probably when you missed your period, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Okay, and then you can see the arm buds forming, the little tail that you've got at one time. Here is an eight-week embryo, uh, and that would be prime abortion time, I guess, if someone's wanting to abortion. But that eight week, you can see the eye, ear, uh, and this thing would be it's an eight and a half, five and a half times the actual size. So that's obviously one and a half times bigger than it would be that six times bigger. Uh, magnification over there or whatever. So it's very small. There's our three germ layers. Ectoderm forms the, the mainly the nervous system, the epidermis, the skin, hair follicles, look at that pineal gland, pituitary gland, cornea, eye, blah, blah, blah. Mesoderm is cartilage and skeleton and muscle. Uh, and an endoderm lining the digestive tract, urinary bladder, salivary glands, thyroid, parathyroid, and thymus, etc and respiratory tract too. So endoderm, all those are super important. The idea of stem cell research would be to take some of these cells early on and grow new brain, new skin, et cetera, and taking, creating cells that are dedicated to make skin and maybe creating new skin one day, or new organ genesis. We haven't been able to do that yet, but you can see we think we can do that by grabbing some of these early cell development and maybe grow another organ someday. A fetal period, nine weeks until birth, Okay, we'll just kind of, she just gets a little more detail than I want here. She, she's going to talk about placenta formation. There's a little embryo in there. Placenta is that organ that connects baby to mother that is shed after birth. Uh, the the umbilical arteries and veins to carry food in to the baby, oxygen. The fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than mother's hemoglobin. And some of that gets in the mother. That's why we can get that gas exchange there. Baby looks like it's got some little jelly stuff here called Wharton jellies for insulation and, and protects the, the umbilical arteries and veins. Pretty wild. Nothing much here. You can see it here again, showing how it's connected to the placenta. Uh, there even are some cultures, we don't do it in America, but I seen a video one time where the British, they like to, to eat the placenta about a week or two or maybe six months after the baby's born. When the baby starts eating solid food, they cook it like a mini steak and feed it to the baby and the mother. I think it's kind of correct, right? But I thought that's kind of weird. Um, nothing much here. She's just talking about how that gas exchange occurs between the baby and the uh, mother's uh, blood, with the baby's blood being having a greater affinity for oxygen. It's called hemo fetal hemoglobin. Mentions it there. Other hormones involved here: lactin, milk production. A cesarean is surgical move of the fetus, right? We talk about that. Uh, crown rump length. And y'all don't ever had anybody being pregnant, or you know, they go in there and do a sonogram and measure from the crown, crown of the head to the, to the heel of the foot, and that's an indicator of length. And then they can calculate due date by that. Okay, and these are just some major events in the first in, in month three by its length, and the eyes develop, genitals are distinguishable, embryo is about three and a half inches long. Fourth month, you get reflexes in the baby, uh, heartbeat can be heard hair forming, bone growth is rapid, limbs, joints. But now the thing I always think about it, just first I'll know if you're somewhere it's a human. Somewhere it becomes on oh, takes on a soul. I don't have I don't know where I would say, but I would say uh, you gotta have a brain to have a soul because I think the soul's in the brain personally. So somewhere along in here when the brain is developed enough, I, I think it's a human. And I know a lot of people think it's a human at conception. Uh, not sure about that, but somewhere along the way it's a human. Uh, even at this stage, I think it, once the brain is active and the brain is functioning, I, I got to think it's a human for me, but it's still not viable outside the body. So some people would say it's not a human until it can live on its own, outside the body, or live outside the body. I don't know. We'll say that for another day. Y'all can debate that on Sunday at church or something. But it's kind of interesting to me because somewhere in here, uh, we've got to say somewhere between conception and birth, it's a human, right? 
uh, in our courts, picking the third month is just random. The third trimester, the third month is just random picking, in my opinion. It's probably way, way, probably way ahead of that. Uh, movements of the baby is quickening is, is in about month five, and you can mother feels the baby moving. Here's what the embryo looked like in three months and five months pictures. Uh, they can suck their thumb in three months. And that's the limit of an abortion, of legal abortion, is approximately three months embryo. Uh, eyebrows, eyelashes form week six, skin wrinkles, you're about nine and a half inches long. Eighth week, eighth month, excuse me, 10, 11 inches. A lot of skin, fat deposit, blood, blood begins to be produced in week eight to nine, and testes descends down. You're getting big, 12 inches, 14 inches. Uh, Full term is around 266 days after fertilization. A couple of weird things in the fetus, fetus and the baby circulation. Now think about it, they're getting all their oxygen and mother and CO2 disposal. So they have weird, three structures that are unique to babies. They have a little blood vessel called a ductus venus that carries blood from the medical vein to the uh, inferior, inferior vena cava bypassing the liver. Because they don't need to process food, they just use the nutrients in the blood from mother. There's also the hole in the heart is between the right and left atrium called the frame and oval so that the blood skips going to the lungs because they don't really need to get any oxygen from the lungs because you're breathing amniotic fluid for six months or nine months in the wound or whatever it is. Uh, so there's no use of lungs. Lungs don't come on board until the baby's slapped at birth. Uh, and another one is called ductus arteriosus. That's a little blood vessel that connects the pulmonary trunk to the aorta also bypassing the lungs. Uh, I have a good friend of mine whose baby was just diagnosed about six months after birth with this hole not closing properly. I had a little girl in class one time that was very petite, and she said she was actually blue that she was about four years old. That hole didn't close at all, and she was stunning her growth, and she had to go in and have surgery at four or five to close it off. And they're giving her a full lobby pregnancy, but she is almost uh, you know, a midget because of that, very small. She's a little bit over, maybe just a couple inches over four, four two or four three. But if you ever hear anybody having a hole in the heart, the baby's got a hole in the heart, it's that. The frame and oval don't close off. If you have a hole in your ventricle, you're dead. I mean, you're not, you're not gonna make it. Uh, some interesting stuff here about stuff left over with the hole. Uh, mentioned in here too, just reading through this, there's even an indice of maybe uh, more migraines with that hole, more strokes with that hole, because it still may cause problems if it closes later. Uh, you can see the hole would be right here. There's the remnant of it under the, right above the red arrow. And here's the ductus arteriosus, sexual little tube right up there. And the ductus venus is, uh, where's it at? Ductus ligamentus venus is right there bypassing that. So pretty cool stuff that has to, those other arteries just fall off and die. Here's a nice little summary picture walking you through fertilization, pre-embryonic, and then all the way down to that. That's a bit weird born. Uh, Infants are considered premature if they're born more than three weeks before the full term, 38 weeks. And that's more than 12% of the babies are born in that period. Main problems are respiratory and some digestion and thermal regulation. Uh, we already mentioned, remember, surfactants can be sprayed down the baby's lungs so they won't get, they don't make surfactant, they don't make surfactant until the very end of development. So that has been a big life changer. And that's why so many premature babies can live is because of synthetic surfactant that's sprayed down in the lungs. Uh, these numbers are actually wrong. I was just checking this while I go, but what he's trying to say here is that about 30% of the infants born in the 23rd week, which is way early, uh, only 30% Leo make it to the first birthday. Now, if you add those numbers, it's just from type wrong. 56% born in the 24th week, Leo. 75% of those born in the 25th week of gestation, Leo. And if you live 27 to 28, it's almost 9% survival rate. So these, these are the survival rates of premature babies at these weeks, at 23, 24, 25, and then once you get 20, above 27, 28, that's pretty good. Okay, once again, first trial minister, uh, just talking about maturation there. That's the legal limits of an abortion, just throwing out, mention that. Uh, talks about some of the woman's signs during this. Morning sickness, fatigue, breast development. Second trial minister, many women feel relief from morning sickness. Some of them have extra energy in that, that, those, that second trimester. Uh, they feel the baby growing. Third trial minister, baby's growing, then you start to have back aches and pressure. 
heavy uh, pressure on the urinary, urinary bladder, so you have to go to the bathroom a lot. Here's how, what he does to the woman's body. Is that maybe he's going sitting on that, look where it's sitting on the bladder right here pretty, pretty while. Squeezing, making it hard to breathe. Uh, it talks about the hormones kicking in, FSH lights are cut off, right? But our estrogen and progesterone keep going. Here's a couple other hormones involved in this. These may be determining the length of the pregnancy and all. Uh, of course, melanocyte stimulator determines the skin development, makes the woman's uh, the breast skip, skin tone change even in the in, in, in pregnancy of the mother. Other hormones here: prolactin causes milk production, oxytocin makes it fall the milk fall down, lactation. Uh, you know, of course, is going to be a big one there. We'll see that in just a minute. Uh, the, uterus, the uterus is about the size of a fist and normal when you get pregnant. By the time it gets full term, that thing is huge holding the baby. It's amazing how that's one of the most resourceful organs to come back down to normal. This talk about different system effect on the woman. Uh, I want to mention a couple of diseases that's kind of a big deal here. Uh, woman does need to do vitamins and eat properly during pregnancy. Uh, not talking about problems on being able to control urinations and other things it does. Uh, preclampsia. We have heard of this. 10% of women experience this. This is a weird one here. And I, we had a speaker last year come down here two years ago. We're not sure what's going on here. But basically, look what happens. About 10% of women experience this. And it's called not really known. Many think it's insufficient blood flow of the uterus. Others think it may be in coordination to the mother's immune system rejecting the baby due to fetal cells in her blood. But it leads to a development of swellingness, anemia, high blood pressure, hypertension, and high, high protein levels in the blood of the mother, which leads to uh, possible seizures and fetal risk. And the treatment is, the only treatment right now is, is to get the baby out. Uh, they're actually working on this in Jackson, trying to develop some drugs for this. But right now, it can be quite life-threatening to mother and baby, so they will just take, have the baby delivered early. A pretty while, you will read more about that. Uh, of course, labor, you know, y'all know that when she does that, false labor pains, blah, blah, blah. The cervix is going to rupture open right, and you're going to have uh, pitoxin is a, is a synthetic oxytoxin that's given to women a lot of times to induce labor, right? Uh, here's the baby again. Once again, you see what's going on there with all the developments there all going on. The uterus, the cervix has to dilate, dilate 10 centimeters, that's four inches, for the baby to come through. The amniotic fluid ruptures, uh, and that usually is a pretty big event. You'll know it's getting close. My, my, our first baby, uh, we couldn't, she, we got the due date, nothing happened, and we had to go in about two weeks after the due date to have the, the doctor rupture the amniotic fluid, which led to the birth the next morning of the baby. She went in labor that night. Baby also got to turn nose down to come out properly, so they got to do a little twist to ruski, got to bend down, and then come out, and then give birth to the placenta afterwards. Okay, of course, you got to kick in breathing, urinary system kicking in, uh, liver kicking in, a lot of systems all go on board when you do that first breath. Okay, the little score technique they can do to score the baby. This is a pretty cool little table. You want twos. If you get all, all zeros, that's bad. The baby's in trouble. This epigonar scoring of the newborn baby, kind of interesting. I don't think I put much on that, but just kind of cool. High respiratory rate, 60, 30 to 60 beats per minute. Heart rate's high, 120 to 140. Okay, but babies have a little bit of body fat, so they, they lose weight first couple of weeks, pretty common. Uh, the mother is gonna produce milk usually a couple of days after birth, but she has, uh, let's see, this is it, uh, I'm gonna say the word, uh, my pronunciation here is going out. Clostrum, which is a food that's gonna feed the baby for a little while, coming up. They don't really need to know all this. Moving on, moving on. There it is. Costrum is the food that comes out right after birth. It's real thick, looks like jelly coming out. And that feeds the baby until the milk comes in two or three days after birth. Has a lot of antibodies in it, so you have passive immunity as long as you're breastfeeding. Okay. Genres is if you don't get enough, you know, if the baby starts to turn yellow due to the Billy Rubin, Billy Vernon buildup because his liver is not working properly. Uh, English, uh, English, English, English nurse took all the babies out and laid them on the sun, went down a pretty day, and that's when those lamps came into the hospital. So sunlight can break the jaundice down the skin. So pretty common now to keep, they have those baby, the, the warping lamps 
of the right wavelength to break genres down too, to break, to break down the bilirubin, which is calling the genres. Okay, another cool one here is when mother suckles, the baby suckling on the mother is a positive feedback to the mother that triggers oxytocin and, pro, and, and prolactin that triggers the milk to go down in to the nipple. When a mother hears a baby screaming, that milk hormone will kick in too and she'll make uh, oxytocin and she will put milk in her clothes. It's so dramatic, she hears a baby screaming. Okay, pretty cool, quick, kind of went through that kind of quick, but it is a lot there, that, that a lot of it's not super important to know. Uh, then we go back to hereditary, it's pretty cool stuff. Remember genes or sequences of chromosomes, of, of, a sequence of nucleotides on a chromosome that code for a protein. Uh, when I when we first started decoding this about 10 years, 20 years ago now, coming up on, they figured that there's about 108,000 proteins in the human body. We figured there's 108,000 genes. Come to find out there's only 20, about 20, 21,000 genes. Uh, they code for three point, they have about 3.2 billion nucleotide sequences. And remember adenine, thymine, cysteine, guanine are the only four nucleotides in DNA. You have 46 chromosomes, right? 23 pairs, 23 from mama, 23 from daddy. Uh, it is worth noting that the person who just first discovered this is how, the, how genetics worked was uh, Mr. Gregory Mendel, who was the father of genetics, doing his, his P experiments in the 1800s, almost at the same time as Darwin was doing the uh, evolution theory. But uh, so he was doing some, some garden P experiments and he came up with the concept that hereditary and everything that there are what we now call genes, he called traits for specific characteristics. And for every characteristic, there's two traits, one from mother of the plant and one from father of the plant, the male and female plant. So, so, and then these two traits come together to compete. And the key to genetics is you have two traits for everything, one from mom, one from dad, and the, then they can be co-dominant, one can be dominant, one can be recessive, or they can both be recessive. He used lowercase letters and higher case letters for that today, and we do too. And we'll look at a couple of these genetic crosses here in just a second. Uh, so diploid organisms have two of each of those 23 pairs of the humans, it's 23, and other animals is different numbers. Uh, the 23rd pair is the sex chromosome pair, and they are the X and Y. So usually if you hear anybody talking about X and Y, they're actually referring to the sex chromosome, that 23rd pair. The other 22 are identical on the boy and the girl. Okay, at least some identical in the genes that are on that trait. Only the Y chromosome has some of these genes for human maleness, uh, and the X chromosome has the genes for develop a female, which the male would carry in his X, but the Y kicks in on it. They even have a, a section of the Y chromosome, they call it the sex determined region of the Y that triggers maleness. But probably one of my, they, they kind of clean this up a little bit. One of the most shocking things for men to realize taking this class is that. It appears that in development, the female is the dominant pathway and men are the side pathway. That's very disturbing to a lot of people. That may sound contradictory to the Bible. I don't think it necessarily does, but, but it's just kind of interesting that. Uh, so a better way to look at it, somebody, somebody said this one time, that uh, women, y'all are Microsoft, y'all make the whole world go, and, and men, we're, we're Apple, we're just cooler, and we're like the little side shoot, you know, like Apple computers, you know, not the most dominant, but they do most of the graphics and the really, you know, the animations and all the cool stuff. That's a bad joke. I'm sure that's not true, but it, but it is true that y'all are the dominant pathway. So if you take a, a male XY and take the Y out, then they'll develop into a girl that just can't have babies. Y Leo's, Y-O Leo's, y, excuse me, XO is a genetic disorder uh, for women Leo's. Y-O is a dead embryo. No one's ever Leo'd with just a Y. So you have to have the 23, 20, you have to have 45 chromosomes and the 45th has got to be an X. So in the world of who's dominant, I would make an argument that women are, if you give, if XO is a woman that lives, that she just can't get pregnant, and YO is a dead embryo, that says something to me about maybe we're all important, right? Okay, but women seem to be the dominant pathway, which is kind of cool. All right, now, in genetic disorders, we're talking about a karyotype is a picture of your 23 chromosome pairs. Of course, they didn't put one in here, but that would be, we used to, take a picture of a swab out of the mouth, blow it up on paper, uh, on photography paper, cut out the chromosomes and match them up because they did match out by color and patterns. And then we put them by order of size. So the chromosome number one, the two biggest, number two, the two smallest, and the next smallest, all the way down to the 23rd, 22nd pair is the smallest little runt chromosome pair. And then the 23rd pair is the sex chromosome. 
So they're numbered based on size at the beginning. On each of those, a section that, that codes for a gene or a trait is a gene, where it's located is its locus, and an allele is a various form of gene. So if you have a gene for red hair, that would be a red hair allele. If you have black hair gene, brown hair, black hair, black hair allele, brown hair allele. So alleles are just various forms of a gene, right? You know, curly hair, straight hair, etc. Okay. But always the genes are either dominant or recessive, right? And so if you have two dominant genes, you're said to be homozygous dominant. If you have a dominant recessive, like a big A, little A, you're said to be heterozygote. And if you're homozygous recessive, you have two lowercase, less recessive genes. Okay. And so we kind of talked through that. Your genotype is what chromosomes you have. In humans, there's a couple that are one gene. We'll play around with this. One of them is curling that tongue. If you can curl your tongue, which I can do, then I'm either big C, big C, or big C, little C. If you cannot curl your tongue, which is pretty rare, but it's pretty common, about one out of 30, then you are little C, little C. So your genotype is little C, little C if you can't curl, curl your tongue. If you can, like I can, then your genotype is big C, big C, or big C, little C. We're not sure. So have to do a little test. But my phenotype is I curl my tongue. And if you can't curl your tongue, your phenotype is I can't curl my tongue. Everybody get that? So phenotype is what you physically can do, and genotype is what your genes are. Okay, now let's look at a let's look at one here. Here's another dominant gene, freckles. Okay, dominant freckles, and then it's also expressed in heterozygotes that are big F little F. Okay, not having freckles is recessive. So to be have no freckles, you'd have to be little little F little F. Uh, the uh, attached earlobe, like I've got here, unattached, is dominant, straight earlobe is attached. Uh, others include the uh, uh, Willis Peak is dominant, no Willis Peak is recessive. Okay, so take a look. So if you have two heterozygotes that marry, let's say this is for the dimple, which is dominant. Okay, and so both of them are have dimples in their head and their chin, excuse me, and their big D, little E, or big D, little D. So what you do in this Punnett Square, you draw a line like this, you put mom up here, dad over here, or vice versa, and everybody in this column gets the little D gets the little D from mother or the big D over here, because 50-50, half the babies get big D, half get little D. From daddy, half get big D, half get little D. And then you fill it in, so you end up getting one big D, big D, two heterozygotes, which are all three of these are gonna show the dominant trait, but only one in four don't have the trait that mom and dad have. So this is a, what's called a dihybrid cross, monohybrid, where you're looking at one trait. Now let's look at something of a, of a different disorder that has what's called incomplete dominance. Sickle cell anemia, to have full-blown sickle cell, you have to have two dominant sickle cell genes, uh, which is life-threatening. These people die you know, before a normal death, a normal life span. Very painful. More common, about one in probably one in 30 or 40 African-Americans in America have uh, are, are carriers, meaning they have a, they're heterozygote. They have a sickle cell gene and a normal gene, okay? And so here's a point square of two of these one in 40 people that might get married and have a baby. And so two heterozygotes, each carrying one of the sickle cell gene, okay, which is the big S, which is a little S, it's recessive. They marry and look, fill in the point square, big S here, big S here, big S and little S. So this one has sickle cell trait, big S from here, little S here, sickle cell trait but one in four have the disease. So there's a 25% chance the two sickle cell individuals, so two people with sickle cell trait would have a child with a full-blown disease. Had a lady in my class when she was about 30 years old, I put this up, I drew it out a little bit better, and she started crying, and I asked her why she was crying, and she said that she had her first child, her husband and her were both carriers. Their first child had trait, and the doctor was so, so arrogant, he wouldn't explain to her that, that her and her husband probably shouldn't have another kid if they didn't want a one in four chance of giving a child this very dangerous disease. And her second child had sickle cell anemia. And she didn't understand that nobody ever told her there's one in four chance that she could hurt her child, uh, which is very tragic. So this is one that we need to talk about. And we all, there are other diseases like this. Uh, another one uh, uh, that comes to mind uh, is uh, hemophiliac. It doesn't work quite like this, but the other way it works like this is the uh, what's the lung disease where people uh, die really early of lung, of, uh, lung problems, they can't breathe because the mucus builds up. What is that? 
Anybody remember that from the rest story? Mainly, mainly among white people. Is it cystic fibrosis? Yeah, good job there, Gabby. Yeah, I'll see if y'all can dig it out. So cystic fibrosis works just like this, except it's uh, it's completely dominant. The, 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 tra the carriers don't have a problem, but two people that are carriers have a one in four chance of having a child with this. So if you're a carrier for this, you probably wouldn't have a kid. I'd adopt, especially if you both are carriers. But, that, but also, by not having children, you stop this gene and thereby maybe help prevent it from going on forward. If you choose to do that. All right. Uh, blood typing works this way. We did, we did this in blood in lab. If we didn't, we didn't do that lab. Yeah, we didn't do blood for crit for we did. I think we did do this before the corona kicked in, remember? But I do it on the board, right? And so A people have what? A, B people have B, and O people have no marker, right? And you can have a person be an AA with two genes that are AA or AO. B people can be BB or BO, but AB people have A and B, and O have two O genes. So that's pretty wild on that one. Remember talking about that in class? So here's the different types of blood. There it is, AA, AI, or AO, BB, BO, AB, the rarest blood type, and O, the most common. So it's a, it's a cool one. And here's showing blood typing there. And you can tell who can be the parent, but you can't tell who the parent is, but you can tell who ain't the parent with this, right? So here is a B person and a, and a, a BO and an AO person. And then they got all of them, right? They got AB one and four, B one and four, A one and four, and O and one and four. So that's pretty random. They get all four blood types. Uh, we already mentioned that the Y is smaller here and it contains some genes in it uh, that cause male to be formed, but there are also some genes on the X. And since men only have one X, then they're more prominent to occur in men, including uh, Huntington disease, uh, not Huntington disease, I'm thinking uh, color blindness, and muscular dystrophy is another one. Muscular dystrophy, color blindness, fall on that or on the X chromosome. So those would be sex link traits or sex link disorders. And they're on the X. Uh, the female, and if it is on the X chromosome, and it doesn't, it's not on the men don't have it, it's on the X. When they have it, they have the gene. So it goes from the mother to her, uh, the female child gets it and gives it to her son. So it goes from father, I like if I get cystic fibrosis, I give it to my daughter, she's a carrier, and then she gives it to her son. Pretty wild. Pretty wild, there it is. So here we go, the mother that has normal vision, XR normal and, and uh, Okay, hold on. XR normal, and then we got this. We got the uh, red, red, red color blindness here. Red, green, lower R have color blindness from red, green. Why? There's no chromosomes for, for eye color on it. So here is a normal vision boy having sex with, uh, having a baby with a carrier mother. And so, so look, one female is normal, one male is normal, one girl is a carrier, and one in four is a color blind male. So see how it goes from mother, that she got that probably from her daddy, to her mother, to her daughter, to her son, excuse me. So daughter, the mother gives it to her son. She gets it usually from her father. Pretty wild. Uh, now here's one they didn't do a good job with, but polygenic inheritance is any, and, but, and look, there's only a handful in the human that's one gene. Okay, and they were like, like the, the, the tongue curling, earlobe. Most of our most of our traits are what's called polygenic inheritance, which are going to be two, three, four, five, maybe intelligence, maybe 50 genes. And, and now here's the coolest thing I'm going to tell you today. Anything that is a polygenic inheritance, you will get what's called continuous variation. And you will get, if you go out and measure it, you will get a bell-shaped curve. So you would get a bell-shaped curve, watch, of average being in the middle and extremes. And a classic example is height. And so average height in America is like six, is like five foot four, five, five. Okay. And then girls, you can look at all that and, it, and you'll get a bell shaped curve. You go out here and weigh mosquito, you can look at a uh, pine cone weight and there'll be an average weight and you'll get a bell shaped curve. So a lot of teachers use the bell shaped curve to do their grades that I can see. Uh, you know, a lot of C's, only a few A's and B's. But bell shaped curve is a cool thing. Project inheritance. Uh, 
is, is very mathematically fascinating to me. Here's one looking at a double hybrid cross here. And you can sell the average height of these. And you can see there's a pretty big distribution there of, uh, among height. And that's just looking at two genes for height. And we know it's more than that. Okay. And each mother would look like a double heterozygote. So pretty cool uh, to me. But they, I like, they actually, they, one of the better graphs they did, most books have a picture of a football stadium where they took everybody out of biology and girls wore pink shirts and boys wore blue. And everybody like five, you know, six foot, everybody five, six or whatever average height is got on the 50 yard line. And then and they lined up boy and girl and they took a picture from the press box. And you can just see the, the, the bell shaped curve. You'd have a few, you know, four foot up under, you know, four foot eight, 11 girls over here and a few really tall boys and maybe a tall girl over there, but you had a beautiful bell shaped curve. Okay. And so that's a cool science project you can do sometimes called polygenic inheritance. Okay. Uh, other ones are multifactorial. Environment plays a big role on things too, and they can have an effect. Obviously, environment can play a role on the embryo. Okay. Uh, Down syndrome, it seems to be a bigger problem in women way late in life to have it. We now think it's because the embryo, the, the, the woman's body doesn't recognize the error in the chromosome number in the baby as it develops. We can do amniocentesis. We pull fluid out of the babies to do a karyotype to see its chromosomes. We can also do a chorion bill sample. We pull part of the chorion out that has mother cells in it. And then we can also do another one they didn't put in here. What we get here is we can take blood samples out of mother and pull embryonic cells out of mother's blood and do, a DNA, do an analysis of the DNA. So we have the technology now where we could test for two or 300 bad diseases. And if one wanted to not to abort the fetus, one could, or if one wanted to, uh, we could even screen eggs and sperm and not do a, a moral problem there and then pick a best sperm and best egg out of a husband wife combination to make our babies. And that's kind of where we're headed in the future possibly. All right, what do y'all think about that? Kind of went through it pretty quick, but I mean, that one of my, I mean, we usually don't do it. That's why I kind of put those together. Uh, the reproductive system is going to be a little bit more off of it. There's a couple of them there on development. But I think there's some obvious ones, okay. Uh, and then, but I put those two are linked to get them together. So I pulled, it's going to automatically pull 20 questions out of reproduction and development. But most of the questions were reproduction in the, in the test pool. All right. Anybody, I, thank you, Gabby, for staying online with me so I can at least tell you were didn't get too long. So I slowed down back up. I saw you had a question. Does anybody have a big overlying question? Before okay, now I've got to turn on and I'm just gonna let y'all go do it. And y'all just don't don't go crazy on cheating because if everybody makes a hundred, I'm just gonna do a reverse curve or something, okay? Uh, but I mean, but do you worry? I don't know if it's gonna be hard to even use the book or, or Google with I think I'll give you 50 minutes to do like 98 questions. Two of them five point questions. So Dodger, get to those, go through them, guess, 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 get to the short answer. Do the do the one on the reproductive cycle, female cycle, right? Be sure and knock that one out. Yeah, I learned my lesson last time. Okay, and I'm sorry <laughs> about that, dude, but I'm gonna, like I said, I told y'all, if, if y'all do fair in that grade, and I may go back and curve that one if everybody is fair on this one. If I see a distribution like I did on that one, I'm gonna go back and curve it. The high score was 92, so I may go back and curve it up. But what I may do is go back in there and do those some of those, uh, uh, the uh, chapter quizzes or whatever. You know, we may, we may have more drop grades too, but I'll go back and rank some tests if I need to. We're gonna have three or four A's in here. No matter what what y'all do, we're going to do it with some A's and B's, and C's, and hopefully no D's or L's. I have a question, real quick. Okay. So I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, but is the SLO a different test that we have to take after, or is it? It is different? in. That's it. That's the first 50 questions, and I went in okay. there, and I actually went in there and cleaned that up today to make it a little bit. I just took SLO out of it. It's part of the the questions you're going to take. Okay, sounds good. Which makes it actually easier because there should be 50 easy questions. Honestly, I mean, they're real like bonehead questions. And then the second set, once you get to 51, you're going to go, whoa, it's getting a little bit more detailed. Okay. And that was my way I thought was better for y'all to do that, right? I thought. So we don't have drop grade. All right. And that's fair. That's fair. So yeah, that's so it's combined. And so it's like 98 question tests but two or three of them are short answer. And there are a couple where you got to write a term in and some of the other one point questions. But I have it set on 50 minutes right now, about 45 or 50. I think y'all had 45 on that last one, right, Dodger? I think I added five more. But I don't think there's as many written questions in there this time. 
Hey, I've enjoyed y'all guys. I appreciate y'all coming on here. Uh, wish everybody else would. I'm going to try to get it uploaded. I wanted to, I know, you know, you got one taking it tomorrow. I wanted them to have an opportunity to see it, but I'm going to uh, let it record. You know, let, and it takes me a little time for it to process. So I may be able to load it up before I leave here tonight. We'll see. Thank y'all so much. Anybody else got a question? I haven't turned loud grades in. I think I was waiting on a couple people that didn't take the loud final, trying to give them a chance. Lord, I got one girl that just did everything until three weeks ago and she's quit. And I called her last Thursday and I said, why did you not take your test? My wife, I went down. I said, well, drive up here. Take the test in Walmart, make no parking lot. And she's just like, let me take a bath and I'll come up there and she still ain't took it. So anyway, so anyway, I'll work with y'all, but y'all got to work with me. If you're having trouble, give me a holler. Okay, I will see how this goes. But I'm not going to try to make y'all come in at one time like I wanted to because I was too late getting the test together. And I think that would be a real hardship to make everybody come in at 11. However, several teachers did that. And they even made y'all turn your camera on like we did on the Zoom. And I don't think that much cheated when we did the Zoom the other day. So, uh, but y'all, some of those were some high grades. So, so like I said, uh, y'all can, can deal with that uh, on Judgment Day if you want to choose a bunch, okay? Uh, we, we, hey, we've got a nursing instructor, mother helping the student touch in on her nursing test. That didn't go well. So look over this so you'll be ready for nursing school because uh, there's going to be a lot of development in it and probably a test or two on that. All right, I'll see y'all later. We may have a debriefing after. If I want to, if y'all want to talk about the grades, I might do something Thursday night on here for a minute and that you can ask me some questions. If anybody emails you a bunch of questions, we, I may call a meeting just for the, whoever shows up and we can talk about grades, okay? Don't see. I'll see y'all later. I gotta go home and cook hot dogs. See y'all. Anybody else?